Hello everybody. Welcome back to this series on preparing Curse of Strahd for the Shadow Dark RPG. This is technically part two, although I'm calling it part one, because this is going to be about kind of my first session and then moving into actual prep. Last time in the first video, I kind of just gave a background on the changes I had made, the group that I have, and uh, and sort of, you know, indications of, of what I might be doing with it. But uh, today I wanted to talk about what this, you know, what the story kind of has, or how the story has developed so far, what I'm planning for the story, and then going into um, actual prep. So, um, so hopefully I'll be able to do that a little bit today. So for our first session, the players began on a coach headed into Barovia. They um, had already, you know, gotten to know each other by this point. Um, as I talked about in the last session, there was sort of a prologue that we did in the session zero, but it was very informal. We didn't roll any dice. We just kind of talked about, you know, we talked about it and how things might have occurred and who might have done what in that kind of opening scene where the, the one character, uh, Arthur, as he, as he decided to name himself, Arthur was captured by the cult and was going to be sacrificed. But um, Varya, the antiquarian, she tracked down her book, which was being used for the ritual, um, and Ulysses, or Ulysses, as yes, you're kind of calling him, <laughs> Ulysses, um, uh, the cousin of Arthur, the uh, Ulysses was the descendant. He was simultaneously trying to rescue his cousin, and so he found him while uh, Var Varya found him. And then uh, we have, um, oh gosh, uh, Pavel, I think his name is Pavel, uh, who is the, um, is the, uh, was the beast, was part of the, uh, the cult who rescued, who changed his mind and kind of helped rescue Arthur from the sacrifice. So uh, the four of them, or rather three of them, and then Pavel was following behind on a horse, uh, were riding in a coach through the Svalich Woods, or Svalich Woods, we call them Svalich, that's how I say it, but the Svalich Woods, and um, then they were um, attacked by wolves as the fog got thick and the horses spooked and jumped off the road basically and crashed the carriage and the the driver died and one of the horses died and the other horse kind of ran off into the woods and some of the wolves stayed at the carts. There was kind of a battle to start off. And um, right away, which I really liked, I thought it, uh, it showed the, uh, the new system in action. Varya leaps clean of the, leaps clear of the carriage and uh, attacked one of the wolves and it leapt on her and bit her and took her to um, zero hit points. And rather than kill her outright or take her into death saves, she made her check, her, her shock test, and failed. So she was incapacitated right then in the first round. They were like, uh-oh. And everyone thought, okay, this is going to be super deadly and lethal. But then on um, Ulysses' turn, he's the priest. He rash, rushed up and cast Cure Wounds and brought her back hit points. So her constitution score went down because she took some damage past her hit points. But she was back up right then into the fight. And so she was like, oh, okay. And, and she could act. So I, I wanted to make sure that characters who took their turn either trying to heal somebody or bring them back up um, or stabilize them or whatever, um, bring them out of that shock, weren't wasting a whole turn of combat so that they would give up their turn, but then the person who was unconscious or who was incapacitated would be able to act right away. And because I'm doing group initiative, they basically just get to act right that round. Okay, so she was able to get right back into it. Uh, the guns worked out really well. One of the guns went off, and I had the the wolves roll a morale test and a couple of the wolves ran off because they were spooked by the loud noise, but then um, one of them didn't care. <laughs> it saved its morale. Um, and then the other gun misfired, so it was very cinematic and it was really cool. Um, and then Pavel showed up on his horse and leapt off and rushed in. He has his axe and he just started hacking at a wolf and saving Varya. It was really, really cool. So it was a great way to start off the campaign. It was high, high pressure, but it wasn't a long fight. It wasn't like, you know, it didn't take away from the the flow of that beginning. And because initiative is done so quick, it didn't, you know, my initial description didn't get sort of bogged down into, okay, everyone roll initiative. All right, uh, you know, Arthur, what's yours? Pavel, what's yours? Varya, what's yours? You know, I didn't have to worry about that. It was, all right, roll initiative. What's your action? So they spent some time in the woods burying their coach uh, driver, which I thought was really funny. I was describing how the wolves were still there. There was howling and they still took the time to kind of put him inside the the cart and seal it or put a heavy boulder on top or tie it off. I think they tied it off. Tied it off. So they put him inside the carriage so that the wolves couldn't devour him. And I thought that was really cool uh, because, it, again, it has this sort of sense of, uh-oh, you haven't seen nothing yet, right? Barovia, you're going to see a lot of corpses and it's going to be pretty bad. So it's, it's nice to have them start off as this very idealistic, no, we're going to take the time. But Pavel was cool. Pavel was like, this isn't a good idea. 
the wolves are coming, and he's a woodsman, so he knows. And so he kind of stood watch, grumbled a bit while the other three um, you know, basically buried this guy with the intention, of course, of going to Barovia town and then sending someone back for the body. That was their intention. Uh, was that we'll keep him in here so he doesn't get devoured by wolves, his body. But then they hiked through the woods uh, with a lantern and made it to the edge of the woods. And they looked out over outer Barovia, um, which, again, if you look at this map here, um, you'll see outer Barovia is what I'm calling this all, this, this section up here. Um, and they come out of the Spalich Woods, you know, around, around here and see the valley in front of them. And I described it as pretty desolate looking. Now, on here, it looks like these are all villages, but I think rather than have them be villages, I'm going to make them in my game uh, more like prominent farms with those are the names of the farmers um, or the family name of the farmers who are there. And so rather than have this be a very populated region, there are still a handful of towns, you know, Barovia, Velaki, and Kresik, and maybe a couple of the bigger um, indications are villages like Astoya over here or Varesht here or um, Zopol here. But for the most part, we're talking Lugosh down here. But for the most part, we're talking about just little farms. So they crossed through uh, this abandoned village of Zopol, and I described it as kind of burned out and totally desolate and empty. And they passed by a couple other farms on the way, and they were just all deserted. But they finally arrive in Barovia town, and a similar thing is true for Barovia. It looks like there has been a lot of activity recently, but there's no one there currently really in the streets. You, they, they know that there are people there. There's smoke rising from a couple of the chimneys of a couple houses, and... People look out of shuttered windows at them or close doors quickly when they pass in the street. No one is open or welcoming to them. So Barovia is, is certainly under this, this pall. And I described how, of course, Castle Ravenloft, this huge ruin up on the mountainside, uh, broods over the village. And I mentioned it several times to the point where um, a couple of my players towards the end mentioned it themselves just offhandedly like, oh, I'll bet it would be really depressing to live under the side of that ruin the whole time. Or, or someone was like, oh, I'll bet that's because of the ruin. Someone was talking about how someone looked nervous. And, and so they kind of incorporated it. I thought that was really good um, touch in their role playing, but I thought I did a good job of emphasizing that, that this castle, this ruin is, is brooding over the land. It's, it's imposing itself and, and causing in a, in a negative way. <laughs> So um, the players did some stuff in town. They kind of interacted with Mad Mary. In my world, or in this game, I should say Mad Mary, Gertruda is her daughter in, in the Curse of Strahd. And in the book as written, she's just kind of enchanted by Strahd and living in the castle and thinks she's a princess who's going to marry this great prince. She's kind of just out of it, this innocent girl. In this world, Gertruda's already a vampire. But um, Strahd doesn't exist, as I mentioned in the last one yet. And so I think what's going on is that the cult found some like liquefied blood or some solidified blood, I should say, and they've liquefied it of, of the strads, right? The old, old strad blood. Um, and they are using it to create vampires, but they're like lesser vampires. Like Rahadin, remember he wants in this world, Rahadin is the leader of the cult. He wants to become a true vampire. He wants to live eternally, but this, whatever is created creates these sort of weak willed, hungry almost not feral exactly but cunning definitely not full true vampires and so Rahadin did not like the results of that so they're using this blood to create lesser vampires sort of more feral vampires um, because they want to gather minions and they want Strahd to be happy and they're just experimenting with things at this point when he comes back so um, that's what they, that's what they've done so they use some of Strahd's blood on Gertruda drained her of her blood and then you know poured it into her whatever it might be and she's come back as this creature so she's visiting her mother and you know very slowly draining her of her life and uh the players didn't think to investigate the woman mad mary they investigated the house and they found that while her room uh gertrude's room has been untouched for a year at least um someone has been coming in by the window and uh and there were some drops of blood on the windowsill and they're not really sure what to make of that. Um, they think, uh, from what I gather from them talking, they think it's someone in town. They think there's a, a ghoul or something in town who's... Um, I don't think they've connected it with Gertrude yet. At least they haven't. Their characters haven't. And they, in the table talk, they didn't uh, bring it up. But the story is that Gertrude ran off with a Vistani. One of the Vistani. Or a Vistana man. And, uh, and that's what happened. But then he turned her over to the cult. Uh, as a fair as a you know because he's actually working for them he, he wanted a sacrifice uh, and so they gave he gave her over 
because the Vistana or the Vistani in, in, in the book as written, and I think also I'm going to emphasize it in my world, are divided about this whole thing. They kind of know what's happening. They know that Strahd is possibly returning. Some of them want it because he's always favored them. He likes them and he gives them great uh, benefits. Others kind of know how evil he is. And so they're hesitant right now about resisting him. And Madame Eva, Madame Eva, I have a whole thing planned for her. I'll talk about that more in a bit. So Barovia Town then, when they came to Barovia Town, um, things were bad. Things were bad. Uh, but they went to the Blood on the Vine or the Blood of the Vine Tavern. And they talked to uh, Mirabelle, who I made kind of the, the proprietress of the place. And they were packing up. And then I had uh, Alenka kind of give them the rundown of what had happened in town and bad things had been happening in Barovia. So the, the harvest, I'm setting it around Halloween time in the fall. So I think that makes sense, right? But the harvest, which was about to be gathered in and some of the early crops were all rotten and things had been bad. And so the farmers had bad experiences with that. And then there was this sickness that seemed to come from the well and even the river, uh, Ilvis or Ivlis, depending on the, I think this is Ilvis, but it's Ivlis in the book. Uh, the river water was making people sick too. Um, or at least they thought it was. Uh, and the well water was as well. And so people started to get sick and die. And then their bodies were coming back to life. At least that's what some people say. Uh, and they were attacking their their uh, families. And um, then there was this big fire in the in the in the warehouses where they were going to store the the granary, where they were going to store the um, the harvest when it came in. And so the, the most of the town went to put it out. And in that chaos, the burgomaster uh, was killed, and his daughter. Someone tried to take her. Um, Irina, but that Ismark, her brother, and uh, who happened to get back and, and rescue her and, and stop her from being taken. And the thing that tried to take her kind of leapt out the window and then it looked kind of like a, maybe a man, but, but when it was outside running through the moonlight, it was kind of like a wolf running off into the woods. And so I think that's going to be one of the um, werewolf attendants to Rahadin was sent to get another victim. Um, and he, was, he picked Irina. And I think um, I'm not going to make Irina sort of like the incarnation of Tatiana necessarily in this one. I, I don't think I'm going to do that. But I do I do like the idea that Ismark is going to ask them to take Irina to Velaki. That's one of the ways of getting them out of Barovia and to Velaki. So anyway, they heard these stories from Alenka and uh, the three sisters were planning on leaving. Now they're half Vistani, but they're welcome at the Zerpool Falls. And so they were they're going to go there because they think it's at least more safe than Barovia town because they know that the Vistani have, have kind of blessing and a protection from this. So they're going to go there. They haven't told the players that. They just said they're going somewhere safe, and they haven't invited the players yet. Um, and then I added a new character in, Dr. Maxim, um, because I wanted there to be someone else in town that they could kind of interact with. Uh, Donovich in my... Oh, yeah, the church also was attacked. The church was attacked, and Donovich hasn't been seen since, and uh, Doru has ran out mad and has been taken in by the doctor, and he's kind of raving. And no one's gone into the church since the attack. People haven't didn't come out. A few people tried to go near, and they haven't come out since. So something bad is happening in the church up on the hill overlooking the town, but no one's kind of braved it. And a lot of people have tried to go to Velaki. A lot of people have tried to go east to the woods or south down the road to um, what's down here, uh, very far down to Imul. But uh, it's a very far journey, and uh, you have to go through the Vistani woodlet and uh, across the, past the paint plains of the dead. And it's just not, most people have probably not made it if anyone's made it at all. But Barovia itself is almost deserted. There's very few people left there. Most people are hiding out in their homes, barricading themselves inside, or they're planning on going to Velaki or, or trying to get out somehow. So the idea is Barovia is kind of in the process of being abandoned. And the heroes are there kind of just at the tail end of it. They're, they're coming in right there. So that's kind of where we ended things. They went to doctor the doctor, and they asked him his opinion. And he is, I made him kind of like a <laughs> sort of a skeptic. Um, he doesn't believe that there's anything supernatural going on. He thinks it's a blight and that it got into the well water and it's made people kind of have this feverish state and it makes people go a little mad and then they kind of gets into their brains and they attack people. And he thinks that that's what's going on and that whatever happened in the church was a result of this combined with sort of religious fear, fervor and, and fear. And, and so he's a, he's a skeptic. Um, now, I don't know whether or not he's a skeptic because he genuinely is a skeptic or he's a skeptic because he believes or he's in on it. I haven't yet decided that. I should probably decide pretty soon. Because I was thinking if, in fact, the well was poisoned, he'd be a perfect poisoner. So maybe he's involved with a cult, or maybe uh, maybe Rahadin charmed him, or one of the vampires charmed him, and so he doesn't really remember doing it. And so this, the, the, the skepticism is a bit more imposed. I also made him, I think, I'm going to make him be in love with Irina. Um, and so he's 
maybe he's doing this to protect her. Maybe he thinks that she'll, he'll, like, you know, she'll be given to him or something. Who knows what? I haven't decided whether he's good or bad. But I, I like the way the characters, and the characters liked him. They all liked him, especially one of my players who had been playing his character as a bit more of a skeptic too. And so here was like a meeting of the minds. He was like finally a rational person in this town after everyone's talked about its curses and, you know, the dead rising. Here's somebody who actually knows what he's talking about. So that was kind of cool. Um, that was kind of cool. Um, and that's where we kind of left the first session. It was about two and a half, three hours. It was a lot of character uh, role playing. It was a lot of interaction with the world, a lot of setting and tone. And um, it was great. It was really, really good. So um, let's talk about what I'm going to be doing in session two. Now, um, I have a few ideas, a few ideas. Um, here's my document on Barovia Village. I just I add in uh, pictures and things, and I have some events. Now, I don't know how much of this I'm going to keep, uh, and I have a bit of a dungeon here, the church. I haven't finished up. Um, I have three dungeons that are in Barovia in the region. And I don't know, I'm gonna build them out. I don't know yet what I'm necessarily gonna to connect to them or how I'm gonna to connect to them, but I know that I want the cistern where the well kind of leads to, to be a thing the players could explore. And they could go down there and they could maybe find the remnants of the poison or traces of the poison. Maybe there are corpses down there. Someone who went down to try to figure out what was poisoning the water. Um, maybe there's a, a back way into the crypt beneath the church or something like that. Maybe there's a, a, another thing beneath Barovia town. Because I mentioned that Barovia is old. The village is the oldest village in the valley. And so maybe it's built on top of another ruin. They find it down there or something. This is a cistern might lead to a dungeon uh, down there. They can find clues or maybe the cult has uh, the cult, which is you know, responsible and apart for all of this is down there. Then I have the church uh, and the church is a dungeon. I have some, I took a map off the internet um, and I kind of marked it up with just, uh, you know, page, uh, not page numbers, but uh, location numbers of things happening there. And then I marked up in Barovia, um, the different rooms. So I have the narthex with uh, the closed doors and it's marked with a bloody crest. And the bloody crest is, is I'm taking is sort of the, 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 the mark of Barovia, but it's actually, um, it's the, uh, it's kind of a smeared version of it. And so um, I actually think, no, that's not it. Um, let me see if I can get to it. Cause it's actually, I, I like it. Here we go. Um, yeah. So I just took it and I kind of just like smudged it out. So it's like someone took, um, you know, the, the, the Strahd's crest, but it's just kind of in blood and is smearing it. So it looks a little like wings, but it's mostly just kind of like a, a bloody mark. But they're going to find that, in, and that's the sort of the mark of the cult, is this bloody crest that they have here. Um, so this is the, the main part of the church, but I have a few other, I have a ground floor, I have an attic, or the second floor in the rafters, and then I have the... Uh, the basement, the Church of St. Constantine, which is what I call this, uh, this church. And so there's, the, there's going to be this dungeon they can explore if they want. Um, the main part of it is going to be figuring out what happened, and they can figure it out like, really easily. But I put brother or Father Don Donovich, instead of being the person who assists them, and Doru is the vampire, I swept, swept, swapped it around. So Doru ran screaming from the church, and he's mad now, kind of seeing his father transform into this thing, or just seeing what happened. But his father has been turned by one of the vampires and now he's a feral sort of vampire and he's he's living up in the rafters in the second floor he's made himself a little coffin basically a resting place and so the players can go investigate that he's going to be prowling about at night uh, trying to get uh, someone he could devour and so he might find someone uh, maybe they'll, they'll hear that someone went missing last night and uh, find traces of it leading to the church but then there's just some other zombies and a couple ghouls in here uh, I didn't want it to be too hard. I kind of wanted it to be more eerie and spooky and deal stress damage and kind of give an indication of, okay, this is happening. Because a feral vampire, they probably can't take him in a fight one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, he will kill them. So they're going to have to do the daylight thing. And then, of course, they'll, he'll be easy. And I actually really like that. It'll give them a, um, you know, if they just storm in here at night, which they probably won't. I mean, they, they, they're probably too smart for that. Um, then they'll know something's really wrong here uh, because they'll probably all die. <laughs> um and I think if that happens, I think what'll happen is you know, he'll he'll take one, kill them if if you know, kill them maybe, and then wing it, uh, fly off, and uh, go back to Ravenloft or something like that. And so they'll have this maybe recurring feral vampire villain that killed one of the party members, and I can introduce a new character. You know, if that happens, that'll be the worst. So, well, I don't want to do a TPK or anything like that. But I want you know, he he feeds on one of them, and and we'll see what happens. But I imagine they'll not come here at night. I imagine they'll come here during the day, and and they'll find him and stake him. Um, 
Because uh, they have the Book of Strahd. And so if they find things that relate to vampires uh, in that book, they'll be able to reference it and find out what the book says to do with them. Because I'm making the book kind of like, again, I think I mentioned this last video, but I'm making it sort of like the Necronomicon or like, you know, the, uh, the, the book of, you know, something from um, H.P. Uh, Lovecraft, this book of mad ravings and the book of vile darkness or something like that, where there's a lot of information in it. It's badly translated. It's in like 30 languages. It's got, you know, cultish diagrams and spells and, you know, some treatise, part of a treatise on death and life and creatures of the dark. And just, it's a huge tome that has just you know, tons of information. And so if they come across something that is an undead that their characters would have no indication what to do, but the players kind of know, like, oh, that's a vampire, right? Then the book will be kind of their in-world way of learning that knowledge. Um, that, oh, yeah, it would make sense. I'm going to look at the book to see what it says about this kind of creature. And sometimes the book won't have a lot of information, but it might have a, a clue that I can give them, and then they can act on that, right? So I have that. I have um, some, some zombies. Um, I have uh, a few very, you know, like <laughs> the, the, the altar has the bones of St. Constantine. So if they break it open and take them, then they have a plus one to cast to turn on dead if they wear or carry those. So, you know, if you want to break into the, the, the church. But, like, you know, it's sort of a, I don't know they'll think of that. But if they do, and someone mentions that the bones are consecrated and, and, you know, the actual relics of a saint, then they can get them and use them moving forward. Um, and then I had 13 dead bodies, which each has a 1 in 6 chance of being a zombie. So I, didn't, I don't want to know exactly how many of these things will rise up, up in examining. And, of course, two of them will be completely drained of blood, and it reveals that they fell. So that means, you know, indicating that they were up on the rafters uh, or they were dropped. And then um, in the vestry, the birth, marriage, and death records are missing. And I wanted that to be because the cult is looking for the ancestors of those who, who slew Strahd in the first place. And uh, Irina and Ismark are two of those descendants. The others are going to be the Mardikovs in, in um, Velaki. And then I'm going to have uh, one of them is, is sort of a revenant um, uh, Vladimir Horngard, he was one of the originals that killed him, and he's here. Again, he's still here, but he's a revenant now. I'm going to keep that. And then I think the fourth hero is going to be the illegitimate daughter, or was the illegitimate daughter, of Sergei and Tatiana. And that line is the line that my one hero, the one character's from. So he's from the line of Strahd's brother and Strahd's wife. And in, in my world, I took, I took a different approach. Tatiana was Strahd's wife. That he married her, and then Sergei came into the picture, and then Strahd went into war and was presumed lost and captured and tortured for a long time. And in that meantime, Sergei and Tatiana fell in love, and they assumed Strahd was dead, consummated their their relationship, <laughs> and uh, then Strahd returns and finds them in bed together after the child's been born. You know, so he's been gone for a couple of years or a year or something like that, and he finds that they're here, and so he just kills Sergei outright when he finds him, and then he has her burned alive basically in, in his mad uh, you know, jealousy and rage that he's been tortured and, and and actually I'm gonna have it be that he only escaped because he swore his soul to these dark powers so that's kind of you know he was wandering he's managed to escape was wandering through the wastes found this amber temple which I'm not putting in Barovia I'm putting way out um, uh, you know found this ancient and asked to preserve himself and so he has um, that's where he got his powers from. And he returned and found this. And so he has given up everything to get home to her and she's betrayed him. And so he kills Sergei and then he, you know, burns her alive and she curses him. And that's partially why he's what he is. So um, the daughter, though, was secreted away by one of the soldiers, basically. Um, when Strahd was ordering everyone destroyed and burned and all that, he, this baby was saved. And then for years, you know, 20 years or something, he, he ruled in, in terror. And then she came back with these other heroes and killed him. And then she left Barovia. And so that's the sort of the line there. So um, he lo he's looking for those people. Because, or the, rather, the cult is because they want to offer them to him sort of as like a gift. Again, Rahadin is hoping that Strahd will give him the life. And so he wants to bring him back and give him, you know, here, here are all these people who, who have a van. You know, we've killed a whole bunch of them already, but here are the ones that directly did it. Because that's part of the reason the cult is throughout the rest of the world is they're hunting down these various um, descendants and killing them. Um, and they're using that sort of life force <laughs> to capturing it or whatever and using it to power Strahd's return. Okay, um, so the birth, marriage, and death records are all missing. Uh, there's a box of collections if they want to get some money. And then there's a ghoul with the cultist robe. So one of the cultists who attacked the church with the vampire was killed here. Um, and they didn't bring his body for whatever reason. They left it there. And so 
I don't think they thought it would matter. And so they're going to have an indication, okay, the cult's involved in this attack. The, the symbol on the door will tell them that, but also this, this body. And then there's Father Donovich's room, which has a little hand mirror, a holy symbol, and a chest with a pistol and some shots if they want to take that, um, which will be good because they're not going to be able to buy a lot of ammo, so having that. Um, and then um, just a little bit of extra clues and, and stairs and a little creepy moment with a broken organ and a corpse slumped against it, just a zombie. And then there's a sleeping bat swarm, which is during the day, so it's it, at night it's absent. So if they come during the night, they, they, they don't have this bat swarm. But if during the day, it's up there and it might like you know swarm and hit them off or something like that. Now you'll notice that there are these little number numerical indicators next to some of the creatures or next to all the creatures, uh, at least the first time I entered it. And what that is, is it's a reference to my document that I've made, which is a sort of bestiary, uh, or bestiary. Basically, I, I went through Shadow Dark RPG, and I, and I took the monsters that I wanted to include in, in Barovia, and I organized them. So I don't have to go back to the document every time. I can just come to this, uh, because it's an easy document to parse, don't get me wrong. But I want to just have it all right here. So I have it divided into beasts, and then I have it, um, the different kind of beasts I might want to include. Um, that, that could be found here. Then I have humans, basically human classes, um, NPC classes that they could be. Um, so that I know, again, what my options are, and they're all together. Then I have magical creations, which is just, you know, if there's if ever a situation where there might be a, a mage who made something, I include them here. And um, then I have uh, monstrous beings, so like the night hag, uh, hellhounds, invisible stalkers, nightmares, oni, a shadow, strangler, were rat, werewolf, will of the wisp. And then I have undead. And then finally, I have vampires. And I have Strahd himself, and I have his stats all statted out. Um, and then I have a vampire, which is kind of the regular vampire, and then I have vampire spawn, which are the feral creatures. So the three kinds of vampires. So Donovich is a vampire spawn. I think Gertruda is a vampire, but not a true vampire, which would be what Strahd von Sarevich is. Okay. Um, so uh, these numbers are references to that. So that way I can add them in and just quickly say, oh, yeah, okay, so it's number two, and I know where to go. Uh, there's an easier way of doing it, I'm sure, but I just thought it was fun. I did it that way. Um, then I have um, just you know little bits of uh, um, bits and bobs, right? Um, and then um, the basement, which I haven't yet done. Um, Dora's room. He has a, he's in love with Gertruda. He was. He's a portrait of her. And I think she's the one that changed his father. And so it's part of the reason he's mad is that he or gone crazy is that he is, um, he's, uh, you know, shocked at what she did. He probably let her past him or something or, or she didn't kill him when she could have because she, she knew or I don't know what. She tormented him and killed his father instead. So Donovich tried to stop her and stop and protect his people who were in the service with him. And, and so he's now a vampire. But Doru is allowed to escape for whatever reason because Gertruda has some remnants of feeling or because she's uh, confused or because she's still sort of an innocent. I kind of want to portray her that way, um, where she's sort of an innocent, but she's just like, you know, well, kind of a little bit like Lucy Westen Westen Westenra, I think is what her name is, with Lucy from um, from Dracula, right? The booful lady, as the little kid calls her. It's just almost, I mean, she's not innocent in any way, but has that air of, of being still uh, perhaps innocent and is not. So that's how I wanted to play Gertruda in that way. All right, so that's Barovia Village. That's what I've prepared so far, along with my Ben Richtons. Another large part of my prep has been, um, where is it? Has been uh, character portraits. So I've been going online and just gathering portraits for the various characters that I like. And so I've, I've done a lot of uh, portraits for people from Barovia. I've gotten a lot of maps that I really like, individual houses and things like that. Um, but yeah, this video is almost 30 minutes, so I'm going to stop this one now. Um, in my next video, which I'll release at some point, I'll probably next, I'll probably just go right into it, um, I'll be doing my prep for my next session. So this is, again, an, again, kind of overview of session one and the prep that I've done for session one and just after session one. And then I'll be talking about what I'll be doing in the next one. So catch you guys then. See ya.